Uh, it's your conference final preview edition of Extra Time. Four teams, only two will go to MLS Cup. But here's the trivia question for this show. Raise your hand at this very table if you have scored more playoff goals than Zlatan Ibrahimovic. <laughs> Everyone looks one way. Raise your hand, man. All right, all right. Kevin Carr, the original. Dyron Espria. Dyron 1.0. Two goals, yes. four assists, and like 700 playoff Dyron, minutes. Dyron, Dyron, Dyron. Kalen. Kalen. Yes. <laughs> Kaylin's on extra time, and it starts now. Uh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental. From the AT&T MLS Studios in Midtown Manhattan, I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, Matt Doyle, David Goss, Kaylin Carr. What's up, boys? Conference final week is here. We are now, if I'm doing my math correctly, 13 days away from MLS Cup 2019. Oh, the season is fast. almost over. It's almost over. In years past, we had a whole nother month after when MLS Cup is this year. <laughs> this time around, we get the rest. What are you going to do with your rest, Kalen? Uh, probably go do movement episodes. I don't oh, know. God. Yeah, yeah. Mm, it I was looking, stop. looking for something more from you there. Movement does not stop, uh, Weeby. I could tell you were deeply engrossed in something. I finale. Pull, working on the finale I, I right now. Pull you Season back finale. in here. Where can we it? get a little teaser? Yeah, can we get the? Uh, no, 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 no. That is the teaser. Just that's, that's it. it. That's that, the finale. There will be a finale to the season. <laughs> yep. Gotcha. He will confirm the Everything season ends. will end with Everything something. Ends. There's this thing I worked really hard on, but I shan't. Just do it better than Jack. I realize previews don't they don't help. I think people want to consume the Mystery. thing right away. So they just don't, they don't even want to know it's coming. Just forget you heard any of it. Let it happen. Anyways, let's go do this preview episode. Okay. Let's you know what is coming? <laughs> the conference finals. LAFC Seattle Sounders on Tuesday, 10 p.m. Eastern. ESPN, TSN, TV in Canada. We will have match day central pregame and postgame shows. Dax McCarty will be here. Ike Opara was going to be here. He will now not be here, but maybe he'll be here later, like MLS Cup week, something like that. Wait, He's Ike. Ike. Strong Defender of the year. Ike is going to be here? He, no, he just shows up when he wants to. Wow. Strong performance, We are Ike. not. Good let's job. just say we're not the, his like Michael the Boxall. Min, like the Minnesota United defense before That's what I'm Ike. Saying. Well, I'm saying we were not his Michael Boxall. Because like he, he filled in for Mike when he needed it, nice. but not us. Atlanta United, Toronto FC, Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern. FS1, TSN, Tevia. You know all that already. Match Day Central pre- and post-game shows. We got your full conference previews coming up. We have a long laundry list of questions. Atlanta fans and Seattle fans believe that we do not talk about them enough, or at least in the right context, or not with the right amount of respect. How do you feel about the fans in that regard, Kalen? In what regard? Well, but Weeby was just saying. Uh, I think I blacked out. <laughs> I, was, I was just waiting. I was waiting for something this else. This is going to be an interesting show. I was yeah, waiting sorry. for selective, <laughs> selective hearing from Kalen Carr. So, Gino Dest, he is going to play, you already know, for the United States. Mm -hmm. So, all that hand wringing, all the willy wonty, it turns out it doesn't really matter in the end because he is committed to the U.S. We'll talk about that. Greg Berhalter sent a I'm sorry note. Apology, I guess, is what they normally call those. Uh, very uh, eloquent of me right there yeah, to naturally. the supporters. And also, the U-17 World Cup started and didn't go that well. And I think you guys have some takes on that. Wait, what do you apologize oh, for? Uh, for not uh, applauding American outlaws and also fans. just the result. In Canada. Just, and, yeah. yeah, just the Canadian result. But uh, a big game in Orlando coming up in November. And then we have a bunch of Seattle Sounders fans, I understand, in the mailbag. Is that correct? We do. And it has nothing to do with talking about Seattle. Cool. I actually prefer that because we'll talk about Seattle a lot wow. here. Uh, North Carolina Courage. Campeones, campeones, sole, ole. I've been singing a lot at home. Just wanted to do that, that for you. That was one-sided. Really? That game was just. Yeah. Oh, I thought you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I misinterpreted. Yeah. For nothing. Yeah. Red Stars, Sam Kerr did not want to talk after this one. Reportedly walked out with the hood up because it was not one that you want to remember for them, but North Carolina like Courage got like the win. like 25 minutes in on the field, so I would not want to have tried to talk to her. Yeah. She missed a couple of game. chances. Pass. She did, did not have the game yeah. you would have expected from well, her. Well, congratulations to North Carolina. Best player in the world, would you say? I don't know. You don't know? All right. No. Mm. Best forward in the world, I think is fair to say. Okay. Forge, one. Cavalry, nil. The second leg of the Canadian Premier League Championship will come up on Saturday, but right now the Forge have the advantage. I think the Cavalry were sort of, they were sort of uh, fancied. I'm pretty sure Tony Chani plays for the Cavalry, so you know I'm a fan. Yeah, big fan, big uh, fan. We'll, see who, we'll see who takes the first Canadian Premier League, and then also USL Championship playoffs are ongoing. I'm now in my Pittsburgh Riverhounds kit, which you're not so cool with. No, I don't care. Was I North love Carolina. that stadium? Yeah, man. yeah. Hi, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool. Yeah. 
They're on. 7 0 winners. Big winners. Right by so, the Duquesne uh, incline, which is the steepest residential road in the United States of America. Really? Mm. Uh huh. Mm. Isn't that San Fran Road? No. Let's no, let's the save Duquesne our incline. Let's save our worthless trivia. That is awesome. For, I like that. Done. Done. Sacramento Republic still in it. Real Monarch still in it. Phoenix Rising who had that amazing streak still in it. And Nashville SC who will join them less next year still in as well as long as uh, the Pittsburgh Riverhounds who play Louisville City. Let's get to it and let's start with this. So, let's finish with this. Home field advantage was huge in the USL playoffs. I think only two road teams won the entire Sacramento. Yeah, and I don't remember the other so one. So two in the Eastern Conference in the play-in round. Okay. Both won. It was Birmingham and Charleston that won mm-hmm. on the road. And then Sacramento won on the road in the second round. So three out of like almost twenty games. Yeah, yeah. Sort of. There's it, our segue, yeah, Weeby. Drives at the Audi 2019 MLS Cup playoffs. Uh, we're going to preview both these games in depth. But first, I want to start kind of ten thousand feet up, and I look at these four finalists, and some things stand out to me. Five of the last six uh, finalists in MLS Cup. So the last three years. All but LAFC, these teams have been the finalists, of course, the last three champions, as well in Seattle, 16, Toronto, 17, Atlanta United, 2018. You knew that. The other thing, first time ever, no founding members of Major League Soccer in the conference finals. So none of the teams that were there in 1996 have made it, and that's the first time that that's ever happened. If you look at these four clubs, you can reasonably sort of define them as – Let's say clubs in the upper echelon because, you know, some people shy away from big and small, and I think that's probably correct, but in the upper echelon with the highest expectations and because of that, the highest spending or maybe vice versa. The top four in compensation according to the Players Union statistics and in guaranteed comp according to Sport Track, also top four in player market value according to transfer market. Take that for whatever you will because it could be complete hooey. I don't know the math on those. People like to quote them. We are going to just quote it here to make a very broad point that the top four are there. Atlanta's one, LFC two, Toronto four, Seattle seven. And spending, Toronto is one. So all of their talk about being underdogs maybe doesn't always jive with the money outlaid. LAFC four, Seattle six, Atlanta seven. That part is interesting. And then combined trophy count is 19. Now, we did include Canadian Championship here, so Toronto FC have a boatload with nine. Seattle have six, Atlanta three, LAFC one. That's just the shield this year. But... To me, this is parity versus stratification. We hear a lot, and we've talked a lot on this show about stratification in MLS and whether or not this league is going to kind of sort itself out based on spending, based on expectations, based on investment outside your first team roster, whether that be academy or facilities or scouting or whatever. Doyle, you led your co- your your uh, column, your preview column. With Did you this. enjoy that? Uh, I've read it now that you pointed out that my <laughs> rundown matched your column. But what do you think about this idea? Does it jive to you that there is sort of a stratification happening yeah. and that this year's playoffs and these four teams are an exhibition of that, or is this more one-off? Uh, it's definitely an exhibition of it, I think. And uh, it, MLS is still a league of parity because there is a, a salary cap that is relatively low on the world stage. Any one of these owners, any of these teams can hit it, can uh, you know go spend on a, on a high-level DP. I mean, everybody... 12 months ago, there, nobody would have been talking about the Revs as a relatively high-spending team, but now they have a USL team on the way, they've expanded their academy, they brought in a big coach, and they signed two big-money DPs. So you can go from not having that to having that really quickly. Um, but these four teams were, in their ways, early adopters. You know, Seattle got in there. Um, I mean, they had TAM players basically before there was even TAM. And we we saw how uh, Toronto completely remade themselves as a franchise in 2014, 2015, how Atlanta and then LAFC came in and said, we're going to check every box. Now, it it hasn't happened all at once for like LAFC. They still don't have um, a USL team. But talk to anybody who watches a lot of youth soccer, specifically people like David, and they will tell you LAFC's academy is maybe the best in the league already. Um, Toronto, you know, everything from, from spending transfer on transfer fees to spending on, you know, huge salaries to mining the local leagues for talent like Jonathan Osorio to, uh, you know, making sure you have a huge staff, analytics department, scouting department, USL team, all on down the list. They, they are making use of every resource available. All four of these teams are making use of every resource available to them. And it means not only do you get the high-budget, high-performing players like a Joseph Martinez, 
but you also have um, the margin for error for the just in case those guys don't produce, as happened with P.T. Martinez and Ezekiel Barco. Ezekiel Barco was the you know most expensive transfer in the history of the league last year, and in the playoffs he was the human victory cigar. He played no meaningful role in those playoffs. Like that tells you that Atlanta have done something right beyond just going out and signing the most expensive guys that they they could. And we're seeing it with LAFC as well. They lost Adama Diamande, or Adama Diamande for two months down the stretch, and they were able to find the right pieces and plug in and just on down the list. You have to have a sort of all-encompassing approach, and these four teams embody it, and that's why they're all 180 minutes from MLS Cup. I would second everything Doyle said. I think for LAFC, two of the huge examples, Brian Rodriguez, the fact that you're on a record points pace and you bring in a player who's one of the biggest signings in MLS history, like under the radar, who happens to end up being a huge part of what you're doing now. And last year, Andre Horta. Yeah. They went out and basically took a flyer on a DP. It didn't work out and none of it affected the way their club was run. And I think Doyle made a good point in mentioning the off-field stuff so much because there is a structure in MLS. You can only spend so much on your roster. But I think we could all say from being around this league, from meeting with people, from going to games, from being in clubs, there's a difference in staffing. There's a difference in facilities. There's a difference in structure across Major League Soccer. And I think that's one of the things you're seeing. So for fans out there that say, well, my team has three DPs or my team spent money on TAM, there's a lot more than that. And I think Doyle was smart in pointing out scouting departments and the build out from, you know, GMs and USL and Academy. You go to some teams and they're robust. They're huge staffs. They have people experts on everything. And you go to some teams and there's people working multiple jobs and hands in different pots. And it's harder to be on top of your game so that while signing Joseph Martinez, you're also scouting Julian Gressel. To do those two things at the same time is not easy when you have the same person doing both jobs. Can I say it's also just decision? making at an even higher level to commit to and choose the right people to run your organization. So in Seattle, Garth Lagerway, in LA, Thorington and Kuntz and Bob Bradley, of course, if you're talking about Atlanta, we've talked all about their sort of triumvirate up top, which has changed. Paul McDonough was so attractive to other teams, he did such a good job, that Inter-Miami came and got him. But you have Boca and you have Darren Eels and you have that staff behind the scenes. I mean, Every single one of these teams, and on the other side, what I said, Seattle, I said LA, I said Atlanta, uh, Toronto, yeah. obviously, and they've made a transition now, but Ali Curtis was a trusted, known builder of not MLS Cup champions, but Supporters Shield champions in this league. Like it, It's decision-making, it's sticking with it, it's giving those decision-makers funds to do it, and then they've kind of let <laughs> it run, and here's where it runs to, yeah. right to the brink of MLS Cup. And to answer your question as to whether this will continue, in short, for me, yes. <laughs> I think this gap that we saw between even LAFC and the rest of the field um, and these top four teams or these big teams in MLS is only going to widen. I think we're going to continue to see this happening because these teams are not complacent. They sell an Almiron, they go out and get a PT Martinez. Even on the managerial side, you lose a Tata Martino, you come in and you get another big name, Frank DeBoer, who for all the criticism has managed to get his team to some finals and win them so far in his first season so far, which is not easy to do in a new league. So, when you look at these different pieces, yes, the infrastructure, players want to play for these clubs. If you want talk, go around MLS, who do you want to play for? It's no surprise that some people leave some places and go have success in other places. And you see them within this environment, within a Seattle, within a LAFC, finding really either a new life, a new lease on life, or maybe guys that are even overlooked, finding a better structure or a system around them to bring the best out of their games. So... These clubs really aren't waiting for anybody at this point, which to me is exciting because that helps push the league forward. It helps that I think that golf is important for fans to recognize, players see it from the inside. I think the media is recognizing as well. So I think it's a positive. You had like direct experience with this ten years ago when you left a fire team that had been good but was maybe starting to head in the wrong direction, culturally speaking, and you went to a Houston Dynamo team that had basically nothing but success for the like the previous eight or nine years even when they were you know the quakes and like I think that culture matters more than anything else and you, you probably feel it whether you're a player or an executive or the guy mowing the lawn absolutely I remember you know in Chicago 
things on the pitch were falling apart. It was the first year, 2010, the year we didn't make the playoffs. And that next year I got traded to uh, Houston. We had none of the soccer-specific nothing. We hopped in our cars. I remember riding in Jeff Cameron's car. It would be 115 degrees, and uh, we'd have to lay towels down in his, uh, I think at the time he was do, do, driving something a little more modest. <laughs> it was like a Honda. <laughs> and, but we didn't want to, um, like, you didn't want to mess up his seats, and then you'd go back, and we'd have to move our stuff out of the stadium. But I think because other clubs had gotten their soccer-specific stadiums, and Houston had always wanted to do that, the next year, we, we went to the final that year because everything that the most important things that mattered, which was Dom Kinnear, uh, Wade Barrett, Tim Hanley, Steve Ralston, the coaching system there and the infrastructure around us was good. And all the character, the spirit of the group, the quality of that, the tradition of those clubs, uh, of that club um, was there. So we got to the final and then we opened up a new stadium and it pushed forward. Now the club has a new challenge of, as far as how do they get back to that standard. But um, it's important for the, that core to be right. And I think Seattle has that. And that they remind me of my Dynamo teams as far as their personality. I think Schmetzer as well, winning those little margins, the quality. But they've really taken it to another level as far as the infrastructure around it, the standard of, of the facilities, the sports science. And then uh, I think that tradition just continues to build on itself. Their consistency is, is incredible to me. One last thing I want to add in, which is we mentioned, you know, the front office and the structure and the leadership. I don't think it's a mistake that all four of these clubs are led by people who experienced Major League Soccer that have background in this league. All four of them played in this league, right? If you talk about GMs, technical director, president, whatever. Carlos Bocanegra, of course, went and played overseas. And Darren Eels played college soccer in the U.S. and was here before Atlanta United got set up to learn it. I don't think that's a mistake. Um, and I think for fans of teams that are going to be expansion teams or fans of teams that are trying to change their identity. I think it's something that's interesting to look out for. I don't think it's necessary that the top guy has that because you can hire people under you. But I find that it, there are moments where some teams are thinking we have to change what we do and look outside the league and bring in new ideas. I think that's fantastic. But the, with the growth of the league, there's more smart people that are coming out of Major League Soccer because there's just more people that have been through it over the last 25 years. And there's a clear identity for clubs that win in this league and understanding of Major League Soccer. All right, before we get to the nitty-gritty, which we will do in about 20 seconds. I want to make one last point on this front, and that is that it's not just spend, TAM, DPs, facilities, uh, ambition. There is something to what you're saying, Kalen, especially, and what you said as well on the day-to-day -day and the teams that you have because there is parity still. Mm -hmm. There is a salary cap. There is a limit. There are places where you can sort of No offense, but Subasa Endo started a game. There you go. Yeah. See, and this is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's the Subasa Endos that you develop. It's – Christian Roldan was a guy who dropped in the draft. People were like, I don't know. He might not be that good in MLS. Bam, best 11-style player. LAFC, Latif Blessing is a guy who dances after U.S. Open Cup goals off the bench for Kansas City and is not going to be a starter for them. Mark Anthony Kay. He actually started. Over and over. Well, he did in the Open <laughs> Cup. In the Open Cup, yeah, he yeah. did. But not yeah. in actual Major League Soccer matches okay. when they were the best team in the Western Conference. Um, Seattle Sounders have those players. LAFC have those players. Mark Anthony Kay, as I said, would be another. Atlanta, Julian Gressel is that guy. Miles Robinson is a guy. It's not just can you go spin money on finished product it's in major league soccer can you identify the right guys and develop them into difference makers and maybe even best 11 players but you still need to spend <laughs> on the you, do, you do but you have to do all of those things Absolutely. and all these clubs do that all right let's get into the nitty-gritty right now lafc seattle sounders on tuesday now we can stop being in love with everyone 10 p.m eastern espn in the u.s espn deportes in spanish as well in canada tsn tva season series this year lafc did not lose to the sounders they had a win and they had a draw they won 4 1 at Bank of California, which is where this game will be played back in April on the 21st. Both these games are 500 years ago. Shoot. Yeah. Carlos Vela, two goals. Martin Kandike. That was the game where he was just like threading yeah. all the needles. And you were like, oh my God, this guy's going to be absolutely nasty this year. Now, Jovan Jones and Raul Rudez did not play in that match. And then a week later, because I guess this is how they do it, I think it's how they did it uh, last year as well. 1-1 at Central League Field, rolled on red card, early goals, Vela and Morris in the first four minutes, and then Seattle just held on for the draw. So all time, LAFC have not lost the Sounders. Three wins, one draw. One of those wins, Dave, you and I were at. It was Stefan Fry having the ball go through his hands from the Laurent Simon free kick in the first ever game at Bank California Stadium. So that was sort of a wash as well. This game, questionable. This is the big one. 
Rodolfo Zelaya with the left <laughs> foot contusion. You know I love him. I'm just kidding. Mark Anthony K. He was that, on the field fast to celebrate yeah, post galaxy. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He that that good. contusion did not hold him back there. <laughs> Mark Anthony K, though, still questionable with the hamstring. Uh, Seattle, no issues for them there. Let's start with LAFC and go broad. We've said this a million times. We talked about it multiple times. You're probably tired of hearing it. You've been given a shtick on Twitter for talking about it in relation to Atlanta United on the last show. Does LAFC need this to cement their status as the best MLS team of all time? And it's a weird one because this game sort of falls in between their two boogeymen. One was right. LA Galaxy and Zlatan. The other is just MLS Cup itself. And the Sounders got to be pretty happy to kind of sneak into this middle ground. Yeah, because it's it's almost like a trap game, which is weird to say because the Sounders are, you know, as Kalen said, they are the most consistent team in the league, really the most consistent team in league history with 11 straight uh, playoff appearances. They know how to win in the playoffs, which they prove almost every year these days. Um, they have in Nico Ladero, one of the all-time great players in this league, in my, in my personal opinion. And they have internationals at just about every spot. They have two goal-scoring game winners in Reed Diaz and Morris. Um, and they are such prohibitive underdogs. And they are coming in this little spot. Between, as Weeby said, the great boogeyman of LAFC and the ultimate goal of LAFC, which is to win MLS Cup, that it almost feels like Bob Bradley's got to be careful and make sure his team doesn't overlook this the Sounders side. Like you have to be able to come out and like either execute your low block like you did against against LA, or just jump on them, jump on them and strangle them like they did both games. Uh, in this year's regular season, um, but it like if there's, it is weird to think of a conference final as as a trap game, but it, it really kind of is. Also, that's partially down to the new format of over 180 minutes. If if the LAFC made a mistake, you would say they could still come back and yeah. win it, right? There would always be more time, similar to what TFC had in 2017 when they lost to Columbus. But you were like. Josie, Bradley, Victor Vasquez, they're going to win this at some point. That's what you would think, but in a one-game knockout now, you come out, you slip up mentally, you're down 2-0 at halftime, it could change everything. And so for LAFC, there's no, there's no room to falter, and I think if, if I was part of this LAFC coaching staff, which I could not be a part of, I'd be incapable of, I think you come out on the front foot because that's how you get your team in a place to say, let's jump down their throat. Let's run them off the field in front of our fans. Let's prove to everyone that no one belongs on the field with us. That's the way I think you mentally turn your team on to say, let's get after this. Doesn't that open you up to what happened in the second game, which is Jordan Morris scoring very, very early? I mean, you start to try to push out. That, and that's... Second, game, that second game should have been 6-1. Okay. Like, they, it was back I thought April, L though. LAFC. This is a different LAFC team than it was then. And a different Seattle team. Fair. How heavy a favorite should, should LAFC be, Kalen? Heavy. I mean, they they finished 16 points clear of of Seattle in the regular season, so that should show you the gulf in the consistency over the over the course of a season. But in a one game, I, I still have them as the favorites. I expect them to win. I expect them to win MLS Cup. Um, I've said all along. I think in years past, you could say that about Toronto FC in 2017. They went ahead and did it in 2018. You could say that about Atlanta United. They went ahead and did it. I think this LAFC team falls into that category. Um, I don't expect the Seattle Sounders to talk much about being an underdog. In fact, I, I would be pretty shocked if they did. I think every single player to a man on the team is probably going to have heard that from some reporter at training or whether they go online or go on Twitter or wherever they uh, decide to go. But I, I don't. I think that will fuel them to some sense. But I, I think the role of an underdog is for somebody without expectations. And, and that is not the case for this Seattle Sounders team. This team is a team that is used to being in finals, getting to final conference finals, MLS Cup finals, U.S. Open Cup finals, and winning them. So I, I would be pretty surprised if they came into this game and Schmetzer goes in the locker room and says, hey guys, we got nothing to lose. We're, we're just out here playing against... The, uh, everybody says... I don't think that's going to happen at all. I think this team has the experience. I think they'll have that chip on their shoulder, but that's kind of the way the Sounders team always plays a little bit. So uh, I, I think they will get behind the ball. I think they have to sit behind the ball. Uh, the idea of whether you want to call it bunkering or not, I mean, to me, that's the playoffs. 11 men behind the ball, get behind it, 
You want to go open with LAFC? Definitely played for Dom Kinnear <laughs> in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> and Juan, thank you. Yeah, it's a snow, but it's not as Dom Ball. Yep, you know, third most winning, I think, MLS coach in, in MLS history. Uh, but I, I think if you want to win, if you want to give yourself a chance, they have to be tight, especially between that back line and the midfield line, and then look to hit on the counter uh, through Jordan Morris. But this is a team that can play open and be, they've been in those games. The Dallas game was like that. Their game against the Galaxy was like that. They can also score goals. They can play a 4-3 game. That's just not the game that you want to play against this LAFC team. Set pieces, winning the small margins, making it tight, hitting on the counter. That's the formula for Seattle. It occurs to me that this year, LAFC are sort of the juggernaut that the Sounders are trying to knock off. But maybe in a more long-term measurement, and let's just say the last four years, Seattle are kind of the Western Conference juggernaut, right? Two MLS Cup appearances almost two championships, a team that's always in the conference finals, the level of consistency. In some ways, this is kind of LAFC trying to say, well, this might be our conference now, at least when it comes to chasing MLS Cups, chasing playoff success, because it has been Seattle's for a long time when you Mm -hmm. start to measure those things. Am I off in that thinking? I'm just kind of spitballing here. I see you thinking hard, Doyle. I I mean, maybe. Like, like Seattle have set the standard for consistency, and they have had – you know, I think that 2014 team they had was one of the great teams I've ever seen in MLS. Um, but mostly, when I think about Seattle, the last like five seasons, it's been that second half surge, and then trying to win the moments in the playoffs, and, and like it's led to you know consistent year over year results. But I haven't gotten the sense like Seattle aren't monsters. They're not going out there. They didn't. They've never done or at least since 2014, they haven't done what the Red Bulls did last year or Atlanta did or what Toronto did in 2017 or certainly what LAFC have done um, in, in 2019. Obviously, it's a statement game from LAFC. You always want to beat the, the best teams in, in your conference, and that's exactly what Seattle have been. Um, but it, it, to me, it, it honestly feels like LAFC are playing a different game. Because with LAFC, it's it's not just about trophies and being consistently good. It's about how they're doing it. Um, and I don't think it's ever really been that for the Sounders. The Sounders haven't cared about, you know, the aesthetics of the game. They've won MLS Cup without putting a shot on goal, you know? Like, they, they don't care about that. It's just not them. Maybe a difference between Bob Bradley and Brian Schmetzer. Let's start with this. Seattle will win if... This is the upset special, which I think is how we should start these things. If they commit numbers back, if they play behind the ball, if they get Jordan Morris on the counter, if Nico Ladero controls the midfield, yeah, what I is think the scenario here? For me, it's if they're clean in possession to take advantage of the openings that are created. At some point, you're going to have even numbers, if not numbers, breaks against LAFC because they're going to commit numbers forward, and we expect Lee Wynn to start again with Mark Anthony K out, so that's you know less of a two-way player in there. Is K officially out? No, questionable, but it seems that way. Yeah. Um, at some point, Morris, Lodero, and Rui Diaz are going to have moments where they're breaking the three of them if they can take advantage of those. Uh, that's th- I, I find it very hard to believe there's a scenario in which they dominate possession in this game, especially on the road, but I find it hard to believe as well that there will be no opportunities for them because LAFC at times defend even numbers and at times make mistakes. We don't know if Walker Zimmerman's going to be available to start for this one either coming off the bench last game. So at some point, chances are going to fall for them. You hope they fall to Rui Diaz in the box. You hope they fall to Lodero getting on the ball, making that run into the box. It might fall to Jordan Morris's left foot, though. And I was shocked in RSL that he didn't even get a shot off the time Romando got caught completely out of goal. That can't happen. Scored, a, scored a goal with his left foot he the did. previous he did. game. He did. He did. So that's the attacking side. What about the defending side? Because Seattle probably won't win if this is a shootout. No, I don't think so. So how do you defend this LAFC side? You have to make the middle midfield. I mean, any time anybody's been successful against LAFC is when they've disrupted their patterns of play through the middle midfield. And that's uh, really just getting around the ball, not allowing any time and space for those guys to turn on the half turn, and then denying service to Carlos Vela. When he gets the ball away from goal, you have to put a body on him. You have to be physical with him and see if he will continue to play through that game. I know that's been a topic of conversation with Mr. Salazar and others. Is like, is he up for it always? And and it's just, it's not even a question about whether he's been up for it, but it is important to put a body on him at certain points throughout the match. You have to do that. Um, and, uh, and then I think just, yeah, looking to 
be solid on set pieces and, and on the counter. That it's it's pretty simple. That is, these are not like it's, to me. It's not rocket science. You have to win the midfield, stop Carlos Vela, be physical with him, set pieces and counterattack. That's that's it. How much the, is it a factor for Roman Torres? Is a healthy because he was day to day, did not play, or came out in the last game came injured, out, yeah. um, or would you even start him for Seattle? So he's know. he's too like he goes chasing. That's the thing about Roman Torres is like he he locks in on, on you know a particular play or a particular player and and off he goes. And I think if you do that against LASC, they will move the ball so quickly and they will move off the ball so quickly that suddenly Carlos Vela or Diego Rossi is popping up in that spot where Roman Torres should be. And Roman Torres is 30 yards away just starting to recover. I don't think I would start him. Um, but I'd start him. Only I, I would start him because, look, he had a nightmare against LAFC at LAFC was the play where he kind of gets cut in the box and I think a Twester just yeah. walks in on goal. But when, when he's bad, he, he can be really bad. But when he's good, he, he's amazing. And the experience, I think, especially in big games, that's one thing I think the Sounders still actually have on their side over LAFC is they have a lot of experienced players, none more so than him. So uh, I think if you're Schmetzer in this match, you go with with Roman Torres in this game and you hope you get the best out of him. It yeah, seems here. like he's been a stabilizing presence since he came back from the suspension from a personality point of view to what Kalen's saying. So that's the big question mark, which is fascinating, is what Doyle said, which is on the soccer side, he's probably not the right play. But on the personality side, who's the leader? You have Stefan Fry, but between Kim Kihi, Ariaga, Svensson, and Roldan, you don't have a lot of talkers. You don't have a lot of leaders in that spine in the most important part of the game. So that, to me, is the most fascinating decision for Schmetzer. I think he'll go with Roman Torres. And it's interesting. He's going to ride his guys. We're talking about so much about the spine, but if you look back to the Galaxy game, it was the, the fullbacks who just got completely abused. Like like Giancarlo Gonzalez and, and, and Dave Rami. But not that the center backs were much or <laughs> at all better. Have you met Diego Polenta? Yeah, right. Oof. Uh Diamond Diamande has not. <laughs> um, but like if you if you look at those first four goals, that was just LAFC identifying a weakness, going right at it and destroying it. And in this game, if you're going to sort of like oh, accept like, okay, Roman Torres is going to have one of his good games, there's still Brad Smith at left back. And that just happens to line up right against Carlos Vela. <laughs> yeah, look, Stefan Fry is another reason to believe if you're a Sounders fan. I mean, what this guy has done in big games, big moments, and playoffs past, we don't have to explain. You remember the save and all the others. He could bail out the Sounders, and they could get a couple goals, whether it's Bia Morris or Rui Diaz and Ladero. They could very easily win this game. I think it would probably be of the two. I don't know about very game. easily. <laughs> very easily was maybe a phrase that I was <laughs> I've using I've been stumping for him to say it's not universe. as far as people think. But but if I walked up to you on Tuesday night at 1230 and I was like, Seattle beat LAFC, you wouldn't be shocked. I would be shocked. Oh, you would be shocked. <laughs> I would be shocked. I think they can do it. I would be shocking based on how impressive LAFC yeah. have been. Like they've just been that good that I think that's why this conversation has gone this way. I, my point is I don't think the gulf is as gap uh, as the gap is as big a gulf as people are Got making it. out to. That's be. what I think as well. And so in this I one don't. game in these I don't know why minutes, I was the one that made that. Well, I think example. the gap I think the gap back in like August was there. I think it was massive. It was like a, you know, it was a chasm that no team could even like, they were looking across like, is LAFC over there? I can't really see them. But after LAFC had some struggles, the midfield wasn't as fluid as it was. Mark Anthony K isn't there. Diamande was out and in. I'm personally not willing to look at a 5-3 against the Galaxy and be like, sorry, back, baby, sorry. Did you, dominant. Did you watch FC Dallas play at Seattle in the postseason? Yes, yeah, for sure I did. They played better for in that sure game and were closer than the Galaxy were at LAFC. Okay. That does not bode well for Seattle in this. No, I'm, in I'm, this and I'm not saying it does. No. I'm not saying they're universally positive, like on the right track going forward. I'm just saying both these teams are at a point in the season where it's not exactly like linear. It's not just like good. Everything is good. You are improving. You're going up or bad. It's neither. It's I would believe it if I woke yeah. up on Wednesday and it was 
Sounders against fill in the blank. Because Weaver's not going to watch the game. I mean, I'll be here. <laughs> I'll be doing Match Day Central. So we know he's not going to watch the game. Yeah, he's going to be well, on his phone for two You know what hours. I meant. You knew what I meant. <laughs> you, when I woke if up. If Ladero and... scores a hat trick in this game and they win, I'd be jacked. All right, on to more pedantic conversation. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. What's your pick? Actually, we didn't do LAFC. I think, do we have to explain that, how they would win this game? We kind of should, right? We, we should because they yeah, didn't. They didn't do their usual thing against the Galaxy. They sat deep and they said, "Go ahead, have sixty percent of the ball. Come up field. We're going to attack into the space behind you." Um, and it was a brilliant match of game plan and personnel because without Mark Anthony K, you, you lack one extra central midfielder who is just a, a sideline to sideline, box to box defensive presence. Who's he, like Mark Anthony K is a menace when they press, and Lee Wynn is really good, but not in that way. The way Lee Wynn is really good now is as sort of an orchestrator. He's not the creature of the final third that he was five years ago with the Revs. He's more comfortable a little bit deeper pulling the strings, and oh, by the way, he had three secondary assists in this game. <laughs> like he, he was able to use all that space the Galaxy offered to LAFC um, to put, whether it was you know, uh, Rossi or it was usually Rossi, Rossi or, or Blessing or Vela uh, or Rodriguez on the run. I don't know if LAFC are going to play like that again because I don't think it's their um, preferred way of playing. I think Bob Bradley really likes the way his team played during the regular season. Uh, I don't know if Seattle would take that bait. Uh, if LAFC have to press and Mark Anthony K isn't available, um, they're an easier team to break through. But they're still the best pressing team in the league when they do that. They still have the most firepower in the league when they do that. And if you may, like if Roman Torres goes off, you know, chasing the ball, then LAFC are built to punish that. If Brad Smith, you know, does a Giancarlo Gonzalez and doesn't get his angles right at fullback, then Vela's either going to get around him or inside him or both just repeatedly. So it's it's a very it's very much a pick your poison with this team. But I'm kind of like shook after that Galaxy game because I don't I don't know what LAFC we're going to see. I expect them to go back to their usual way of being the aggressive team. The only real question for me as far as LAFC goes is, does Adama Diamande start um, with his performance coming off the bench? And I, I think he should continue off the bench. I think overall um, in his time in MLS, I think he's been a stronger player off the bench than from the start. Now, it's hard because he's so talented he's so good that you want to play him from the beginning but the way this team has been structured and set up the way they've been playing how dynamic they are he's such a weapon you look over at him you know 65 70 minutes for the last 20 minutes I, I think they go back to playing the way that we've become we've become accustomed to seeing them and uh, bring Diamande off the bench how about Zimmerman does he go into the starting lineup should he well, if he's healthy, yes. If not, I mean that's the yeah, that's the huge question mark. If not, you know that Bob Bradley has one thousand percent trust in Tristan Blackman. He loves his guys. He loved him before he drafted him. He loved him once he drafted him. He loves him in Major League Soccer. He hates when people don't love him. So you know he's he's trusts him and he's going to give him the opportunity. And honestly, I feel like at times I could play next to Eddie Segura the way he's played this year, and we'd still be okay. Like he's just been so. So smart, his positioning's so good, he has the ability to cover so much ground, as does Blackman, that any mistake they make, they can recover and catch up to it. And then you have Beta Shore at right back, who can play a little safer at times. Um, so I, if, if Zimmerman's not health 100%, I think Blackman gets Can I just say this? about like There were a lot of incredible passes in that Galaxy win over, uh, or in the LAFC win over the Galaxy. Like uh, Vela had that early through ball, and then there was the Rabona to the back heel to that. Please, yeah, I think you're going to say. That Eddie Segura hit first time pass. One touch, 40 yards through the lines while playing as a defensive midfielder, which he hasn't played all season, right onto Diamande's foot to lead to the fifth goal. Now, obviously, Diamande had the bulk of the work left. But in like, the Galaxy, where was anyone in the 40 yards in right. central midfield? Right. But yes. But like, that that type of play just show like when LAFC are at their best, they just do the normal or in this case abnormal things so much quicker than anybody else in this league is capable of dealing with, and they've shown it repeatedly now throughout the year. Anybody going to take the upset here? Nope. No. Nope. Anybody taking the upset? Nope. Nope. 
I'm not taking the upset either. Oh, come on, Weeby. No, no, look, they lost one game at home all year. And he's it was playing like, Riverhound. And Mason he only Toy goes went, favorite. Mason Toy went like Thierry Henry in that game. That's true. So That's I think I'll probably stick with the uh, with the Supporter Shield winners. We'll see. If they win it, MLS Cup will be at Bank of California. And if they win it, that will mean they just need 90 minutes at home to seal their best ever MLS season, which is, you know, by most measurements, the way it seems it would be. Now, Land United has some... Uh, arguments when it comes to that they've already won the double they host toronto fc on wednesday at 8 p.m eastern this one's on fs1 and fox deportes in the u.s they've won a double tva they haven't what won they've won the double no they, they've Fine. won a double oh they are the, this is like they're the, the champions who defeated of, the campions the champions nobody has ever the won the double the i thought you guys won. settled this on the last one nobody's oh, ever won that did. double yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Way you. to go. I appreciate, I Campiones Cup I over I appreciate here. you. I appreciate you. Teams have split this series. One win apiece this year. Both teams won at home. Atlanta United won 2-0 in May. Josie did not play in that match. Osorio didn't start. The uh, Marco Delgado didn't start. He was on the bench. Ezekiel Barco didn't play. He was hurt. Uh, and then Toronto won 3-2 at BMO late June. Alejandro Pozuelo had a brace. He had a PK in the 90-plus-4 in this one. Pity Martinez missed a penalty in stoppage time. Again, a lot of DNPs here. Josie, DNP. Joseph, DNP. Ezekiel Barco did not play. That was the game where the penalty came because of a video review basically after half the people had left the yes, stadium yes. and so they had to call game. them back in. Yes, and then Pity missed it. Yeah. Man, Pity. Mm. All that work mm. for nothing. So Toronto FC are not going to be scared of Atlanta. They will not be intimidated, even without Josie Althador. All time, they have just one loss in six games against the Five Stripes. They have that legendary decision day game in which beer was being chucked in Jovinko and he was taking sips and there were boos for Michael and Josie and that fueled them on their way to an MLS Cup in 2017. Justin Martinez has been pretty good against Toronto. He's got four goals, two assists in four career games. Josie's been all right. One goal, two assists and three against Atlanta, but Josie's questionable. That quad strain still has him uh, iffy for this one. He did take the PJ there and back to New York for that win against NYCFC. Omar Gonzalez was on the bench. He is also listed as questionable for the Reds. For Atlanta, they have two big outs, Miles Robinson and Michael Parkhurst. So let's start with the storylines. Lest ye have forgotten, Atlanta are still the defending champions, and I certainly now have not forgotten because I've been reminded. Thank you, Five Stripes Faithful. It feels like uh, that isn't being mentioned that much in the context of this postseason, like as much as it might have been in years past. When Toronto FC was trying to defend their title and they were falling flat, that's all we talked about was this juggernaut not in the that went kaput. That's a good point. Seattle, that was a big talking point in their attempt to repeat and go all the way to MLS Cup. It was part of Atlanta's narrative, but for somehow, I, I kind of feel like the maybe have they've gotten, it's not short shrift, they've just been second. LAFC have been first. Oh, God. Are we turning Atlanta United into the uh, nobody believe? The or, ultimate yeah. underdog. They're victim. They are the Adrian <laughs> Heath team of this postseason. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Wow. What, how, should, how should they be thought of? just upsetting right everyone. I, I, know. I can't I even know. keep it. I'm just, <laughs> I can't even keep wow. a ledger right now of who he's taking shots. I, I, uh, I reject this narrative, and I'm bowing out of the conversation. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, guys. Sorry. Just what, how, is, what, what should they be thought of? Uh, Atlanta United are heavy favorites at home against Bingo. Toronto FC. Not as large of favorites as LAFC is against Seattle, which I think is just the commentary you need because Seattle's a good team, and yet Toronto FC are closer to Atlanta than Seattle is to LAFC. Uh, they have more talent. They're home. I guess they're not healthy because they're missing Parkhurst and Robinson, but they do have the pieces, it seems like, to fill in, uh, especially with Josie Altador out. So they're going to have the environment for them. They get to host another conference championship. You know it'll be full, and they have the experience to get through moments like this. So they are favorites in this game. They're favorites and they're giants, which I don't know. That's why I don't understand why Atlanta fans are like, "Why aren't you talking about us?" When because you're not talking about them. All we do is talk about them. I don't know if that's true. That's what we're doing. <laughs> that's what we always do. It's what we've done for three years. They have been the darling. Like in the one time comes where LAFC is the darling, and they're like, "But why?" Why aren't you talking about so it? We love you. But this you're, happened. You're, being, you're antagonizing Atlanta fans. I'm not yeah. antagonizing them. I'm just trying Let's to just explain go down to them. Georgia I, and jab somebody we, in the eye with a stick. I right? would like to say for Atlanta fans, <laughs> job well done because you've antagonized Weeby. That's yes. true. That's, He's stuck on this. Mm, mm. That's true. Takes the yeah. bait easily. I am, <laughs> yeah, I'm a bait. Where taker. are they getting at you on Twitter? They're getting at me on Twitter. A, have you been reading the comments too? I haven't been reading the comments. You, you, get the YouTube Weeby, comments. Weeby, also, leave Weeby us a review on iTunes. Weeby reads the YouTube comments. I just don't get it. Like they've been the darling. 
Oh, They've it's been, been up- the team until this Why year. Not? Even last year, they were the team that we said, "This is how you build your team." Oh my God, the Atlanta United are changing Major League Soccer. Their crowds, their spending, their winning, their coaches. What, are, you, are, you doing, are you doing like a fake Atlanta United fan voice now? I don't know. I'm just. What, doing- what are you trying to do, Weeby? Wow. I should not. You're should never gonna be. You're right. never gonna be allowed yeah. in the state of Georgia again. I love the state of Georgia. Mm, they don't love you. Mm, fine. <laughs> I'm gonna pass the baton and just scurry away before the pitchfork wielding mobs come at me. Atlanta's really good. They yeah. haven't. They haven't. They've been good. They haven't played consistent soccer throughout the course of the year. Whether it's where they draw their line of confrontation, what their formation is, uh, the players they're using. Like we all thought that PT was never going to play another minute for Atlanta United, and Frank DeBoer starts him in the conference semifinals, and he gets the game-winning assist. Like none of it has had a rhythm or felt like strength is being added on top of strength. Uh, other than that run in August that culminated with that game against Club America in the Campiones Cup, which was an awesome game and an awesome performance. And if that's the Atlanta United team that shows up on, on Wednesday night, Toronto's in a lot of trouble. Um, but you don't know if that Atlanta United team is going to show up because they've only done it like twice all season. They were pretty good. I thought against New England, they were pretty good, I thought, against Philadelphia, but they weren't great. But there was no point against Philly where you thought they'd lose? Correct. Uh, the other thing about that Club America game specifically, I'd say, is Miles Robinson was a monster in that game. And that's As was big... Darlington Nagby. Yeah. yeah, but that's a big loss in this one, which I think is the one thing that maybe has us away from talking about Atlanta in the playoffs, at least, like we were talking about LAFC. Miles Robinson had been healthy going into the postseason. It would have been... New England, Philly, I think most people would have just easily put them through. But you have a huge question mark in that your best defender is not available for the postseason for a team that, while they have firepower up top, has not been high scoring. So you need the ability to keep clean sheets. They've done it without him, which is a credit to their roster building. Now they're down Michael Parkhurst as well. So there's definitely legitimate question marks along that back line for Atlanta. Again, I think that's the not high scoring. It's just a measurement against LAFC because against the rest of the league, they are quote-unquote high scoring. But LAFC scores 85 goals. you always have to bring LAFC into it, Weeby? That's a good point. This is why I'm people in the away. South can't stand I'm wa- he's I'm big trying to give he's them, I'm trying to tell them. Like, you, you get respect. We respect Atlanta. Like, you should be favorites in this game Weeby big doesn't, time. Weeby doesn't talk for all I put you into the Finals. I might have actually picked them to win it. I didn't. I picked the AFC. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Pity uh, Martinez. He's rounding into form, kind of. Ezekiel Barco. Is he? He's looking better. I every said kind ev- of, every I time, say every time, God, I said kind had, of. Every time PT's had a good game, he's kind of like disappeared. The next game, he's had. He's been a weird player. It's been a a weird year. I'm gonna take it from Weeby for a second. Do we think that Atlanta's gonna play? the same 4-3-3 that they played against Philly with PT in kind of that playmaker role? No, I do not. Really? I think Miram comes back into the team. And it goes back to like that 3-4-2-1. I think so, yeah. Because I think um, Toronto's not – you don't go into the game thinking Toronto will possess the ball the same way Hmm. that you assumed Philly would. And so their best attack has been with both the wingbacks flying forward because it gives them that width and gives – whoever's underneath room to operate. So my assumption is Justin Miram comes back into the starting lineup, which changes their shape a little bit. I think well, I, I, looking at that spot, though, if there's one place that I think there's a weakness in Atlanta United, it's on that left side. And it is, can Justin Miram defend from that position if they play with three in the back and he plays sort of a wing back role? And then even in the last game, Mikey Ambrose, who I know had a good game, if I'm Toronto FC, and I know this goes against what I said with LAFC and Diamande about bringing him off the bench, but I might look at Richie Laria to say he has been so good throughout the playoffs to get you forward. And without Josie Altidore, you don't have all of the firepower that you normally have. Can you get a look at Richie for a full match? Do you give him the start in this game? I think it's a, I think it's a real question as, as we lead up to this game on Wednesday because I know he's been such a game changer off the bench and teams maybe hadn't quite game planned for him, or even if they had, they, they just don't have as much uh, experience playing against the guy to understand how talented he is and what a weapon he is. Uh, but I would look at potentially going at him from the start, especially considering I think Atlanta United is a little bit weak defensively on that left side. My question for Toronto, and the only reason I think this is a possibility is because Greg Vanny has shown in the last week, as, long as, as well as in the last four years, the willingness to change things up. If Omar's kind of healthy. Simon has played pretty well. Is there any chance he goes with a five-man backline and sticks Omar in the middle of Simon and Mavinga 
play it a little bit safe, and you play Pasuelo up top with Benazé and just stack numbers in and just make it hard for Atlanta. I hadn't even considered that. And I even wrote in my column, like, Greg Vanny always seems to have something up his sleeve. Yeah. And, like, remember, 2017 MLS Cup, he went to the 4-4-2 diamond, which they hadn't used for months. I still remember the moment that lineup came out and scrambling and moving it around on the board and being like, whoa. Yeah. Like, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> my my yeah. guy, that was... But there, there are a lot of questions in this game. Like, we don't know whether DeBoer is going to go 4-3-3 or 3 Four, like the four three three has been more defensive. The three four two one has been more attacking. They've at times played really sort of methodical and slow, but other times, especially again in in August when they were so good, they were kind of like wide open and and just saying, okay, let's go, let's hit channels as fast as we can. With, with Toronto, like it, you're saying, you don't think that they're gonna, you're not preparing for them to possess the way that Philly would want to have possessed, but like. I saw that first half in New mm-hmm. York. Yeah, Toronto ran over NYCFC. Um, I like it, this game is tough to predict. Yeah, and especially because we don't know if Omar's healthy and we don't know if Josie's healthy. We're talking like he's not going to play. We've heard that he's probably not going to play. I would. If I were in Toronto's situation, I would be lying left and right yeah. <laughs> about what to expect and what to prepare for. So we don't know. If I was Toronto, I'd dress him. Yeah, even if he's not available just for them to always think there's a chance he could come off the bench. It felt like maybe that's what the deal was with Omar last mm. week, but Josie's a bigger one in terms of like whatever DeBoer is doing, he always has to consider if it goes to extra time and they get an extra sub, is Josie coming on for 15 or 20 minutes? So I agree with you with the way Toronto played at NYCFC. The question would just be, that was the curveball that Vanny threw. Can you throw it twice and not have it hit out of the park in back-to-back weeks? They, like, does he just have to do something that different? A, that was a city field reference? That was baseball. <laughs> <laughs> they, they definitely will up, not Chris? be letting it out in the media because we thought Josie might play against D.C., and he was coming out being like, if I could play, if we're up to me, yeah. I'm ready to go. And it's like, I think to some de- degree they want to have that sort of fear factor of those guys being healthy. But as much as I say, oh, is there going to be a wrinkle or we all talk about it, I, I think they'll probably go with the lineup that got them there, right? Because, like... Every game, I'm like, oh, I think this is it. They're not going to go to NYCFC and do it. But if you're this group right now, they've been successful. They've been able to find it. It's been dynamic at times with Pozuelo moving around and, and Jonathan Osorio, the combination play. They haven't really gone as direct because they don't have the personnel to do it as maybe they had in the past. So I think they'll probably go back to what's been working with them um, as much as we would probably like to overthink it. And so, you have to say for Toronto, outside of Joseph, because Eber was out, it's a similar test in terms of what NYCFC's back line does, the way their fullbacks play, how Alex Ring sits, and probably Jeff Laurentowitz will. So the look should be similar to what they're facing. The only difference is they didn't have as much fear of getting hit you know, behind their numbers when they were pressing high because it was Tati Castellanos who's been good, but it wasn't ever. Now you've got Joseph. I- I'm going to throw out that the biggest difference was Darlington Nagby versus Keaton Parks. Yeah, Keaton Parks struggled. Like Keaton Parks couldn't keep the ball in this game. Like said, you're not. But Parks get... didn't get touches because he couldn't find the place to pick it up, because Toronto showed them a shape they didn't expect. That's one of the things I would say from being there and watching Parks try and find spaces off the side of the box on goal kicks, different moments just to find the ball. A lot of that was Toronto doing something that they just hadn't anticipated. So give me the recipe here, Doyle. Toronto FC pull the quote unquote upset because look, both these teams, big money, big expectations. Uh, what is the upset special recipe? You gotta, you gotta make them react to you. Um, whether it's by pressing, which Toronto have done selectively over the years, including a, a couple of years ago to this Atlanta United team, um, or whether it's by possessing the ball, like we saw them do that first half against NYCFC. But Atlanta, when they're not in control of the game, gets super frustrated and undisciplined. And they allow you either to play through the channels or the, sometimes they'll just allow you, like they'll, they'll go chasing the ball and allow you to play quick one-twos that gets your winger to the optimal assist zones right along the, the, side, uh, the side of the box. So I, I think it's, I mean, whether your game plan is to be aggressive with your press or aggressive in terms of establishing possession and rhythm, like you got to get inside their OODA loop. You know, you have to make them uh, the reactive team. And if you do that, you, you have, and then you don't 
you can't allow Joseph to have four breakaways like the Union did. That's it. Anything to add, guys? I've just been picking against this Toronto team the whole time, and and I just thought I can't. I was like, without Josie, I just put so much weight on that. Um, and and now I, I'm been forced to say I think this team ha- has a chance in this game. I I still think Joseph Martinez makes the difference in this one. And I know he hasn't been maybe up to his standard, even though he's even on an off day, he hits a left-footed banger like the way he did. Um, so I, I think Atlanta United will still get through, but at this point with this Toronto team, uh, I wouldn't be shocked. Atlanta United's path to MLS Cup, what's it look like? Is it just that? It's Joseph? It's yeah. Flo Pogba not making well, it's more more mistakes? It's, it's, yeah, it's no mistakes, but it's also like, look, we, we've all seen Michael Bradley struggle as a ball winner over the past two years. He's not the guy he was in 2017 anymore. He sh- struggles against quick playmakers. And you hit in PT and and Barco, you have thirty million dollars worth of of quick uh, of quick. I don't want to say playmakers because neither is really that, but guys who can make plays. Um, I I think they have to fi- figure out a way to get those guys operating on either side of Michael Bradley and kind of overwhelm him, pull him apart, um, and then at that point you're forcing Delgado and Osorio to track back, and at that point you've broken Toronto's shape, and now you're making them react to you. And then I think when you look at it, if Omar can't go in this game, you have the potential with Joseph to just pull the center backs around. And if you play Miriam and and Gressel, they can get inside the fullbacks and start to make runs there, whether in possession or out of possession. And then you start to have a lot of opportunities to go straight down the middle. You don't need to go outside and hit crosses in because there's there'll be a gap between where the center backs are and where that Toronto midfield is. And you've got a ton of opportunity to play off of Joseph's feet, to have him makes run out and have PT make those runs in and start to try and pull Toronto to one side. And then you see what he did against Philly and laying that one in Gressel's space. So there's a, there's a lot of options there. And I think that's one of the things with Joseph is, I think we've talked about this before, his runs can affect a team whether he's touching the ball or not. And in Simon and Mavingo, you have two guys who chase. Both of them do. And you don't have anyone there to, to hold them steady and to lead. Upset special? Anybody going to take that one, or is everybody going shock here? Because I'm going, to, I'm going to Atlanta at home with Joseph. Wow, this those fans, those fans really got to you. <laughs> hey, I, it's in my bracket. I, that was three weeks ago. I made that decision, so I won't, I won't back off it now. Gas man, good stuff. It's tough to think that there'll be enough goals in this game for Toronto. They can go twenty. The first, I've said this all year. Said this all postseason. If you can go the first 25 without giving up goals to Atlanta, they'll panic. They react. uh, They get uncomfortable. It feels like the atmosphere changes in the stadium a little bit. If that happens, then they throw numbers forward. Now you start to see the ability for Pasuelo. What really hurts is they don't have speed to counter. um, And there's no one to play an easy ball over the top to to stretch the back line, which I think at times is when Atlanta's been at their worst, at home at least. Um, uh, All of that is in saying I've been trying to think of an answer. Yeah, I'll go Toronto. Whoa, I thought you were just going to go straight to Atlanta. I thought that was going to be like, ah. I just think with the extra week of rest, they could do similar things to what they did against NYCFC for longer. Um, and I think there's, as Kalen said, there's just like, they don't care. Yeah. It doesn't matter they're in Toronto, in Atlanta. They don't care the amount of fans. They don't care the size of the game. They have belief. And honestly, I think Jonathan Osorio might be the best American-Canadian player in Major League Soccer right now. And you can play through him. He can do a million different things. He can just make life really hard. All right, there's one pick for Toronto. Are you going to go with... Uh... No, but I do think there is some symmetry. <laughs> no, I, I'm going Atlanta, but I, yeah. I do think there is some symmetry, which is interesting on both sides, is that far as this idea of the narr- of the uh, the underdog versus the new you know, expansion team. That's really sexy. And I, I think that... Um, both teams have a better chance than people think. I think Toronto, including myself probably, uh, I think Toronto still has a chance in this one, although I am picking both of the sexy expansion teams to go through. <laughs> if that's the case, it'll be LAFC Atlanta at Bank of California on November 10th. We do not know if that will be the case. Tuesday, LAFC Sounders, 10 p.m. Eastern, ESPN Family Networks here in the U.S., TSN TVA, and then on Wednesday at 8 p.m., Atlanta United, Toronto FC on FS1, TSN TVA. Match Day Central pregames and postgames on both of those. So look at MLSsoccer.com with the MLS app for the information. Uh, big news, Sergio Dest is going to stick with the U.S. I, I don't really think we need to talk about that. Maybe we'll do it a little bit more later on when the U.S. are getting Next closer month. to, say, another match against Canada. What is our best mailbag? 
fodder here. Dave, give us uh, uh, run us through something here. If let's just say I think my picks, LAFC and Toronto come through. Uh, is this the toughest MLS Cup possible for Lindsey Bradley, who is wife of Bob but mother of Michael? What does she do? Uh, Whoever be, can get that first interview? Yeah, that, that, there that you go. Would be That's the breaking news. I think there are sewn. family finances on the line, right? Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, sure. All on a win, uh, then Michael's guaranteed deal for next year. As reported up. by our good friends. At the Athletics. San Paulo Stage goal, yeah. Pablo Mauer and Felipe million, Cardenas. So that is a, a significant amount. Anything else? The other one here is, and this will actually be a good one, Raise your hand if you've scored as many goals as Latan Ibrahimovic in the MLS playoffs. Woo! How many does he have? One? Yeah, I think it's just oh, the one. What did you have? I'm like lapping. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my, so they sent this to like, us after the Minnesota game, right, right, right. which at the time which he had the zero. Time, would be able to but then Kalen showed up and right, I could do it right. again. Yeah, now he's got to come back. That yeah. works out well. That works out well. All or right. Take this job. How many of you? Yeah. How, many play, on how, <laughs> how many playoff goals do you have? He would be great on extra time. Philly. LA Philly, Galaxy. Galaxy. Oh, it might just be two. That's and that's enough. Yeah. And you that's doubled enough. him. You doubled him up. 100% more there we go. playoff goals than Zlatan has Kalen Carr. That's it for us. 401 MLS, extra time MLS, soccer.com. That's how to get at us following this. We will have about three shows to react and then prepare for MLS. Four assists? Cup. Two goals and four assists. Pretty there decent. Don't forget the assists. Thank Pretty you. decent. Pretty decent. So, uh, yeah. Watch the games Tuesday, Wednesday. We'll see you on Thursday. Enjoy your week, everybody.